65 years ago, man made his first attempt to climb Mount Everest. Since then, hundreds of Himalayan expeditions have set out with the intention of conquering or reconquering one of these formidable peaks. But this is the story of a different journey, an attempt to conquer not the ice, but the air and the water of the Himalaya. Using tiny microlite aircraft to help with the reconnaissance of the deep gorges, a group of canoeists set out to run the river that has its source in the glaciers of Everest itself. All expeditions into the hills of Nepal begin from the country's ancient capital, the city of Kathmandu. The team consists of six canoeists, one climber, and two pilots, all men. The only woman in the group is the expedition's doctor. Their leader is a 28-year-old Londoner called Mick Coyne. One fifty. One fifty. Get out of here. Expeditions require months of planning, both at home and in Kathmandu. Mike Cheney, an Englishman, has spent 20 years providing advice and local organization, and with his partner Rinchen Yonjun, obtaining bureaucratic clearance for innumerable groups of climbers and travelers. Without the help of someone like Mike Cheney, no major expedition could be mounted in Nepal. Start right at the top of the icefall. You may want to try and land at Gorok Chef. Um, that might well be possible. Uh, at 17,000 feet, so it may be, it must be right on the limit of what you can do. But if you do that, you'll probably get a world record or something. Right. All right, Mike. Yep. Getting hard here. Yeah. Getting heavy. Okay. We'll yeah. drop you on your head. Go on, hand roll it. Ah, that's good. <laughs> a white water canoe must fit the canoeist tighter than a glove. Is that the last one to do? You're right. Yeah. No, he's got this one and the other one to do. We just want to hand it to him. No, I think we're okay. A canoe arrives from the factory as an empty shell, and by means of rigid foam inserts, each craft can be tailored precisely. The team has brought a total of 16 canoes, expecting that several will be destroyed or lost in the descent. The Microlite pilots have their own preparations to complete. No one has ever before flown these machines in Nepal, let alone even contemplated taking them to somewhere as treacherous as the high peaks of the Himalaya. The first stage of the trip from Kathmandu to Mount Everest is along a winding mountain road. And although only 120 miles long, the journey takes 12 hours. That, however, is a great improvement because until recently, much of this distance had to be covered on foot. At the end of the road, the real Nepalese transport system takes over. From now on, everything has to be carried by porters. Measured on the map, the distance to the foot of Everest is nearly a hundred miles, and the total weight of the expedition's equipment and supplies is over three tons. Each man or woman carries between 55 and 60 pounds, except for those carrying canoes, which are lighter, but extremely awkward. 30 porters are required just to carry fuel for the microlites, and another four men to carry a spare microlite wing. Altogether, there are 150 people in the column. For the first six days, the route crosses ridge after mountain ridge. Each day begins with a steady 3,000 foot climb, but by afternoon, the track descends again to the floor of the next valley. It is slow and exhausting work, but this is how everything is transported almost everywhere in Nepal. 
and as the main party of the expedition inches its way across the foothills, the two microlites fly in by a different route. For this back-breaking work, each porter is paid £1.60 per day. Out of that, he or she has to buy food and pay for lodging, which leaves 80p. However, since they are not paid for the return journey, their net profit is only 40p a day. For awkward loads, like canoes, they get a little extra. The highest pass in the first week of the journey stands at a height of 11,500 feet. The track then descends over 6,000 feet, leaving one 1,200 feet lower than at the start of the trip. After six days of walking, the canoeists are rewarded with their first sight of the river. It is not a reassuring prospect. Although the expedition was timed to reach the river at the end of the monsoon season so that the water flow would be at its height, no one had expected it to be quite so powerful. Black Bart said that there's been a big flood down here, you know, about last year time. I can't, which, I mean, which way would you get down here, Mick? It's crazy, we're not fresh. We've been walking six days. I'd give you a miss, Rog. Three weeks' time, I think we're looking at it differently. It would have dropped a couple of feet. Anyway, I don't think it's today. No. While the canoeists were inspecting the river, the pilots were getting their first taste of flying in high mountains. Every foot of extra altitude alters the flying characteristics of the machine and the true airspeed increases, which makes landing that much more difficult. Okay, what we've got here is the parachute which you may have to use in the event that you're Airplane falls to pieces, or you uh, hit one another in midair, or whatever. All right. Now the idea is an emergency parachute only, single canopy, and it's 24 foot in diameter. Okay, if you'd like to pull the handle, then Simon, and we'll see what happens. In the steep mountain gorges, an engine failure would mean almost certain death. So the pilots, Simon Baker and David Young, have brought parachutes just in case. Their teacher is Phil Bond, one of the canoeists who in real life is an RAF parachuting instructor. Yeah. Landing on the flat of the feet. That's fine, I'm relaxed. No more praying, son. In that position, a sideways roll to the right. Okay. Push down the side of the leg. Right, straight onto your backside. Okay, up you get quickly. Right. These parachutes have been used from as low as 150 feet. So, although the... the uh, the request is that you use it above 500 if necessary. <laughs> Obviously, you're not going to have much choice in the matter. As the pilots contemplate their future, or the lack of it, the canoeists are beginning to have serious doubts also about their own prospects on the river. It looks a bit evil, okay? Eh? A bit evil. Whoa! The sides of some of the gorges are so steep that they can only get a distant glimpse of the water. It's, uh, it's pretty nasty above the falls. There's no, there's no easy way into that. Even my cubit's going to probably uh, give that one a miss. And there are rocks actually in that fall as well. Assuming the trees are 50, 60 foot high, the falls got to be probably in excess of that. If it was just a 30 foot waterfall, 
with a safe landing area, I mean, that wouldn't be a great problem. But yeah, we've got a nasty set of yeah. rapids coming straight in, straight from the bottom of the fall. Very confused water looking from here. And uh, there's that second drop. It's got huge boulders actually buried in it. I can see the water ploughing off the boulders. The microlites are now flying at 15,000 feet above sea level and are becoming more difficult to handle. The pilots have brought with them two types of wing, a standard version and a specially adapted new model, which they have christened the Kumbu Raven. In order to cope with the problems of high altitude, they have fitted the new wings to both aircraft. This landing strip is at 12,200 feet and is the highest in the area. A thousand feet below it is the small town of Namchi Bazaar. Namchi Bazaar is the administrative and commercial center of the Kumbu region. It is also home to the Sherpas, the famous Nepalese tribe which provides the high altitude porters for climbing expeditions. Tourism and expeditions have brought relative prosperity to Namchi Bazaar. At one time, the Sherpas were amongst the poorest people in Nepal, but now eight or nine thousand foreign trekkers pass through this region every year, and a cash economy has developed. Because there are no more airstrips above this point, the pilots have time on their hands. Above Namche, the vegetation changes and the speed of travel diminishes to allow for altitude acclimatization. Only 15 years ago, one out of every 50 visitors to this area used to die from altitude sickness. Now, with greater understanding of the problem, it is down to only one or two a year. <laughs> Mary Ganjakoski, the expedition doctor, is meanwhile persuaded to offer her services in the pursuit of a new microlighting record. The pilots want to find out if they can take off at such high altitude carrying a passenger. Mary, the smallest and lightest member of the team, is the obvious guinea pig. The airfield is now abandoned because air turbulence can make it dangerous to use. It is 12,200 feet above sea level and as the microlight roars down the runway, no one knows quite what will happen, but it works. Followed by David Young in the second microlight, they set off towards Everest. During the flight, Simon and Mary reached 17,000 feet. For two people, that also was a record. Records apart, from a purely practical point of view, they had proved that the microlites could carry canoeists on river reconnaissance. personal level, they were completely intoxicated with the beauty of what they had seen. That was fantastic. Amazing. Two days march, or ten minutes flying time, further up the valley, the main group was building an airstrip. 
Under the firm direction of the expedition Sirdar, Lakpar Lama, the job was completed in two days, which at this altitude is fast work indeed. What a baby, eh? What a big baby. Yeah. <laughs> there is an instruction writ large in the Microlite Flying Handbook which says simply, do not fly in mountain. Although it looks beautiful and perhaps easy, only very experienced and skillful pilots could hope to survive flying at these altitudes and in these fast changing and dangerous climatic conditions. With an increased landing speed of 60 miles an hour and a crude runway, it requires a certain courage even to attempt a landing in this place. It also requires special suspension. That landing could well have smashed a standard machine. We might roll backwards. Is that a good runway or what? That's a brilliant runway. How long is it? Two days to fix this. It's a wee bit rough. Yeah. At 14 and a half thousand feet, the aircraft lands at twice its normal speed. Yes, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Nice land. Yay! Yay! You can see that it was easy, hard to get high sometimes. It looks as if you're in a bit of trouble. Yeah, but it was. Uh, Quite bumpy in places, wasn't it? Yeah. This I would have taken off that second, third, and fourth hill. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? 14,500 feet in the Himalayas, you expect it? Right. Uh, yeah. And now, for the first time, the whole team is assembled in one place. You. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear my <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to you. You must be used Give me to the biggest one. You must be. There isn't a the biggest one, Roger. They're all the exactly one. the same size. Yeah. I'll have that, that small one that's closest to me. You know, the one about three inches across. <laughs> come on, boy. Yeah, yeah. A real work of art. Come on. Come on. Come on. It'll be 32 <laughs> time you've dished well, that out. They have almost reached the source of the river, but before they begin their descent, there is one more thing to be done. They intend to land a microlite higher than anyone else has ever attempted. In the shadow of Mount Everest they find one tiny, flat space. The problem is, the higher we get, the more runway he's going to need. We've probably got about 150 <coughs> metres here, which probably isn't long enough technically. So we've got a big run out at the end, which we've got to clear the rocks out of. Basically, we've got to make it as flat and as smooth as possible. Just get rid of all the big rocks so that if he comes in and he's gone too fast, he doesn't kill himself. Now, the weather's pretty grotty. <coughs> but it gets much worse, the porters won't work, which means it's down to us. Obviously, no one's going to be able to work very fast because of the altitude problem. At 17,000 feet, this is probably the world's highest runway. Can't do that for much longer. It's starting to get tired. <laughs> Give you a light load this time. Here's the edge of a runway. So where we're filling right down here, you guys are 30 feet out of the runway. How's that? This one? Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Alright, I'm gonna hold. This okay. way. I think that's enough. The next day, the weather is perfect. I must be 20,000 20, feet. It looks really good. Tremendous. At 20,000 feet, flying with a standard engine, which could deliver only half its normal power, Simon Baker was operating at the very limits of this technology. It looks so close to those mountains. It looks like it's going to crash into them. 
still on full power. I don't know why he's not letting the power off at all to start the descent. I think it must be frozen on. Simon's throttle had frozen on, and at an approach speed of 90 miles an hour, he was forced to switch off and glide. Without power, he had had to get it right first time. <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> uh, absolutely magic! Well done. Well, that's like, what a lightning! Hey! Woohoo! Brilliant! 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 Great! Look really high! Look at that! I've got 10 yards left! Yeah! Do it again! 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 <laughs> I would say that was an equivalent of a grade six river. Because of the lie of the runway, it was impossible to take off again. But with a microlite, that is no problem. You simply take it to pieces. It takes about 40 minutes to break a microlite into loads small enough to be carried. The engine weighs 70 pounds, which required a brief negotiation with the man who was to carry it. Turn it sideways, maybe. Good thing it's not very heavy. The wing weighs 100 pounds, and the trike 150. As they trudged away from Everest, what they could not know was that 11 days earlier, a French microlite pilot had crash landed on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. Even worse, on the same day that Simon had landed beneath Everest, the Frenchman had managed to take off again from 18,000 feet, a thousand feet higher than the expedition's airstrip. On the way down the glacier, they passed the source of the Dudkozi River. The Dudkozi River becomes navigable at 14,000 feet. Eleven years ago, another British expedition attempted to run this river, but they were forced to bypass very large sections of it. With better equipment and modern techniques, these canoeists hope to do better. That is no small ambition, for the Dudkozi is a fearsome river. The name Dudkozi means the Milk River. It is apt, for ahead lie 80 miles of continuous white water. As the canoeists begin their journey, the microlites prepare to start their task of carrying out reconnaissance in the gorges downstream. Over the next 80 miles, the river drops more than 11,000 feet. The 
air at this altitude is so thin that within minutes of setting off, the canoeists are fighting for breath. The upper section of the river flows straight from a glacier and the water is bitterly cold. And sometimes, so is the weather. In Europe and North America, the fastest rivers that are run drop at the rate of 200 feet per mile. The Dudkozi is here cascading down its valley twice as fast as that. They nicknamed this section the rock-infested ditch. And every few yards, they are smashed into something. Every mile that passes, the river becomes faster and more powerful and more dangerous. This man is Roger Hyten, famous in the world of canoeing because he took part in the first expedition to the Dudkozi 11 years ago, and also because he once had a small part in the film Ghostbusters. Mike Hewlett, a computer programmer by trade and, in his spare time, one of Britain's top whitewater paddlers. Mick Coyne, ex-marine, veteran of several wild adventures and leader of this expedition. John Taylor, at 37, the oldest member of the team, and the expedition administrator. And Phil Bond, a parachuting instructor. One of the major hazards of whitewater canoeing is to be pinned against a rock. In the worst case, a man can be trapped underwater and drowned. Or the boat can fold up so that it is impossible to kick free. The last member of the team is Chan Swansea, an American from Colorado and a superb canoeist. He handles his craft with the elegance of a dancer. After eight miles of furious paddling, they reach a point where the river becomes impassable. It is the first of two similar stretches that they cannot complete. As in any dangerous sport or occupation, the art of survival lies in knowing when enough is enough. For the next seven miles, the canoes have to be carried along the mountain tracks. One day, the technology and the techniques may be sufficient to tackle such water, but for now, it is quite impossible. When they put in again, the river has been joined by two large tributaries. It is wider, deeper, faster, and much more powerful.
chief characteristic of this river is the non-stop, relentless rush. It gives almost no chance to rest and barely time to think as one hazard is succeeded by yet another. One such danger is a type of standing wave called a stopper. Under certain circumstances, it can suck a man down and hold him underwater, quite literally, for eternity. The trick and the skill, as Mike Hewlett now demonstrates, is carefully to work one's way out to one side and then to break free. All the members of the team are using boats made from the plastic polyethylene. Until a few years ago, whitewater canoes were constructed from fiberglass, but no fiberglass craft could have withstood the battering that these boats have taken. The small red canoes, believe it or not, were actually designed for use in swimming pools. But in the last three years, a few top canoeists have been experimenting with them on white water. So the way that all those boils just push everything back in there, you just got to turn off on that rock, fall back nicely into that stock, go down into those boils, and just sort of bubble around and stay there. Yeah. That's pretty fair. Shooting falls like this is a newly developing art, but you have to be pretty sure what is at the bottom. There is one very quick way to find out, but to get jammed in the rocks under such a weight of water would mean certain death. The advantage of the small red canoes, which are called rotorbats, is that their short length makes them easier to manoeuvre, and because of their rounded, stubby shape, they are less likely to get trapped between the rocks. The disadvantages are they provide less buoyancy, are extremely unstable in rough water, and so demand a very high degree of skill from the canoeist. Mike Hewlett, acknowledged by his companions as the best paddler, demonstrates his expertise over a particularly nasty fall. The others are not quite so successful. Battered from all sides by the turbulence, Roger Hyten remarked later that the only thing that he was aware of at this moment was that he was upside down. John Taylor was equally disoriented. Once out of his boat, a canoeist is entirely at the mercy of the river and dependent on the skill and courage of his friends for rescue. In this instance, Mike Hewlett reached John and together they head for safety. When a man is hanging onto a boat, the canoeist loses most of his control and so puts his own life at risk. But it is a matter of honor 
that rescue be attempted. Roger Hyten once had a close friend who came to his rescue and the friend was drowned. Mike and John make it to the bank, but elsewhere there has been a disaster. Whilst flying in one of the high valleys, David Young's microlite was caught in a violent downdraft. He and his machine were smashed into the mountainside at 80 miles an hour. Incredibly, David survived the impact. His second piece of luck was that the accident happened three miles from an aid post staffed by two American doctors, Ben Levine and Bill Gitter. They reached the crash site within an hour and a half, along with an American medical student and a Swiss expedition doctor. Ben Levine and Bill Gitter stayed with David for the next 24 hours, and without their help, he would almost certainly have died, for he had sustained severe internal injuries. The day after the crash, a helicopter flew David to Kathmandu for an immediate operation. A week later, he was visited by Mary Ganjakovsky. For a moment, so what hit first? <laughs> well, for a moment, I thought I was going to make it. I thought I was going to pull around and make it. I saw the, the sky coming around and everything else coming into place, and uh, and then I just knew at the end, and uh, uh, I said, ah, and bang, tumble, tumble, and uh, then I was sort of falling off the side of the wing, and what, what, when I crashed, I felt this big tug at my stomach, uh, which was the seatbelt, and um, and I, I, I remember rolling gently off the, off the wing, and uh, I just had this terrible pain in my... In my stomach, or anything. Got much in the way of bruises. Got a pretty, pretty big bruise around here. Mm. Well, the doctors were worried, sure. Bill and Ben were worried that you'd broken that bone, the pelvic. Yeah, the pelvic. There. But yeah. apparently you've got no, no breakage at all there. And this is the drain from the uh, the main wound, and um, and this is the main s the main yeah, skull the which I've had to fairly fairly well, yeah. It's Apparently your blood pressure kept dropping, and you needed a lot of fluid. So oh, right. You had five litres of fluid in that 24 hours. And uh, I think without that, then uh, yeah. you wouldn't be here now. Hello. Let's have a look through the night. On, uh, on two hour shifts, yeah. checking out with them. And uh, kept saying, Not hang on in there, man. <laughs> So, I'm a very lucky guy, so, I'm sorry I landed a team in so much uh, heap of trouble, I feel a little wally, but uh, I guess uh, climbers fall off mountains and pilots crash aeroplanes, I don't know. And canoeists regularly fall out of their boats. Swimming in this water, is as dangerous as being caught in a mountain avalanche. Luckily, Paul Main, the expedition climber, had managed to clamber onto a rock. If a man goes loose in this river, he is swept down faster than his companions can run along the bank. Having lost the first safety rope, Paul must catch the second. But the water is too powerful and he is gone. Then, by sheer luck, he is swept into an eddy. It was very nearly a second disaster. Ahead of them, there is now a 70 mile long gorge. The original intention had been to carry out a reconnaissance by microlight. If Simon Baker's machine had broken down, and David Young had been fetching the essential spare parts when he crashed. The canoeists had been told that only the first few miles of the gorge were white water and that thereafter the river became slow moving. It was therefore decided to go on blind, even though, once committed, they could not turn back. At the end of the gorge, where the Dudkozy joins a larger river called the Suncozy, the canoeists were to meet up with Mary and Paul who were to bring in fresh supplies. Thinking that the trip will last only two or three days, they take very little food or equipment with them. Mike Hewlett leads the way.
Only a superb canoeist like Mike could hope to get out of this stopper the right way up. Next comes Phil Bond. Swept underwater, he is lucky to survive. This is the beginning of a nightmare adventure. It turned out that ahead lay another 45 miles of continuous white water, which all of them later agreed was the worst that they had ever seen. It became a simple battle for survival, because although in places they could drag the canoes up the sides of the gorge round some of the most dangerous water, at other times, they had no choice but to go through it. Instead of only two or three days, they finally emerged nine days later. Although occasionally they had managed to buy food from isolated Nepalese villages, sometimes at the end of a hard day, they had had nothing more than boiled potatoes and hot water flavoured with lemon juice. At the confluence of the Dudkozi and the Sunkozi rivers, they are met by Mary, Paul, and an American rafter from California named Jeb Stewart. I'm leaving in 20 minutes. <laughs> the most difficult section has now been completed, but the journey is far from over. Ahead are another 100 miles of the Sun Cozy River, at the end of which there is a small town where the mountains end and the great Indian plain begins. But for now, they are just pleased to be alive. Apparently you've got the big rapids to come. Great. I'm really looking <laughs> no. for Because they're all friendly. They're mean. If you come out, you don't get killed. Whereas that, this that one... Was, that was the meanest river I've ever Yeah. Really? It was really yeah. mean. It was really, I mean, some, really Sometimes you had to really... There was just one breakout, and that, if you'd missed it, that would be it. Woo! Woo! Yeah! Yeah! Thank you. Well, Without any warning, the microlites are back. <laughs> to celebrate their return, the pilots put on an awesome display of low-level flying. One of them very nearly overdoes it. After David Young's crash, the team had sent a message to England asking for spare parts and another pilot. The message had said, Flying here, extremely dangerous. Only Malcolm McBride, acceptable. And at 24 hours notice, Malcolm had left for Nepal, where he single-handedly rebuilt David's aircraft. Malcolm! Hey, Malcolm! How you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. That's David. That's David. Oh, David. Fine. Oh, he's gone. Lost track of time, I say. How's the machine? Great. Well, a couple of bits of chewing gum. So which were the bits that were recovered from Dave's machine? 
this and this and this. <laughs> oh, and the fuel tank. Oh, oh, not, oh. That, that's about it, yeah. Well. <laughs> oh, and the wheels. The wheels are all right. United once more, the expedition can now function as originally planned. The job of the microlight pilots is to fly just ahead of the main party along the river so that they can give warning of any potential danger. Depending on the water level, which can fluctuate several feet within two or three days, or sometimes even within hours, there is a chance of finding 15-foot waves in the narrower parts of the river. In the high mountains, the expedition had had porters to carry its food and equipment, but now that is no longer possible, and so river rafts are used to transport the supplies. Jeb Stewart, the second American, is in charge of the rafting party. In order to meet up with the canoeists, the Nepalese crew has already floated down a hundred miles of the Sunkozi. There is still another hundred miles to go. Leaving the rafts behind, the microlites head down the river to pick up fuel and supplies from a town beyond the mountains. They get an enthusiastic welcome. Back, back, come on, come on, back, back, back. Frightened to leave the machines at the mercy of so many inquisitive fingers, Simon and Malcolm are unable to do any shopping. Go back, don't touch, don't touch, back. It is as much as they can manage to clear a space for takeoff. Four days after drinking champagne at the mouth of the Dutkozi, and eight weeks and 450 miles after getting on the bus from Kathmandu, the journey is nearly over. With startling suddenness, the mountains end and the river flows gently onto the vast expanse of the Indian plain. From the point at which the canoeists first put into the water, the river has dropped nearly 14,000 feet, and the distance that they paddled through the torrents of the Dudkozi was at least three times greater than that covered by the first expedition 11 years earlier. Two stretches of the river still proved to be impassable, 
but it will be many years before anyone can better their achievement.